Um, so today's, today's discussion is about um, if there is a kind of an infrastructure package and, it, and if it included um, uh, money for the internet, uh, what should that look like? And to be perfectly frank, we don't have such a plan in hand. We, I, I have not seen one, um, but people keep talking about that from the new administration and um, up here on the Hill. And we're talking about um, not only a plan for perhaps appropriations of money, but also other types of facilitation of broadband um, and internet infrastructure, which could be tax incentives uh, for private enterprise. And then perhaps um, things that Congress, the states, municipalities could do to enhance uh, private sector capital investment. And those are things like perhaps Anna Eshoo's, uh, speaking of caucus co-chair, uh, Congressman Anna Eshoo, um, kind of dig once legislation and things like that. So we're gonna get through all of that today. Um, and let me make a, a point as I open up this, or kind of set the stage for this. Um, it's really difficult to look into the future about what people in America will need as far as internet infrastructure and internet broadband. Um, and I say that because the Congressional Internet Caucus was created 21 years ago. Um, this is the 21st anniversary um, of the Congressional Internet Caucus. Try to imagine, and Blair can probably like point to what the internet infrastructure was like in 1996. Um, up here, very few members actually had web pages. No members themselves actually used email, maybe one did. Um, and in, in, in the community at large, people had basically a dial-up. Dial up here, there was a consensus that the internet was for a bunch of geeks, tinkerers, and perhaps people uh, looking at um, sexually explicit images on the internet. It wasn't really much good for anything other than that. But you know, there were some you know, prescient members of Congress at the time, Senator Leahy, uh, Congressman Goodlatte, uh, Congressman Bauscher, Senator Burns from Montana, um, that really kind of identified that the internet had potential, could be used for more than those things and that it would be you know, part of the American fabric. Perhaps they didn't know it would be like this today, um, but certainly it was prescient. Um, and we're here today looking at internet infrastructure that, in a way that people couldn't have imagined back in 1996. And then you know, what, will it, what will people need or what it will be like in another 5, 10, 21 years? And that, that's something to consider and put this in context because we, we sometimes kind of look at where we are right now and not actually try to see the larger picture. So um, I have a, all-star cast I want to um, introduce you to. Um, to my right here is Blair Levin. He's a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. Blair, Blair has had many um, jobs in the past, um, including as a financial analyst. Um, Blair also did many stints at the FCC most recently. Um, he was the architect of the FCC's National Broadband Plan back in 2010. Um, next to him is Doug Brake, who's a senior analyst um, for telecommunications policy at the Internet uh, Information Technology Industry Foundation, ITIF. Um, and his Twitter, Twitter account is right there is on, your, on your sheet, so you can, you can follow him um, and Blair. And then next to Doug is Shirley Bloomfield, who's um, the CEO of, of NTCA, which is the Rural Broadband Association. Is that, is that the correct branding? Um, and then next to Shirley is uh, Lisa Schoenthaler. Um, and, and, and Lisa is with NTCA which is the Internet and Television Association. So um, we're going to confuse NTCA with NCTA, which I think I just did. Yeah, I just did. We're here together, too. Yeah, they're different associations. And, and forgive me, um, I did not make up the acronyms. So uh, let, let's just start off. And, and, and these are the, I, I am really just a novice in this. Um, the experts are here. I, let me just say, if you're, there's an opportunity here whether it's this time around or next time around or 10 years from now, that you know, if, if Congress has, has can, Congress and administration can think of a plan to invest in our country's internet infrastructure, um, why would they do that? Um, what would be the return on investment? Is the internet important to people at, at different speeds um, or in different infrastructure? Is that important? Um, I think one of the things that we find this really interesting that the Trump administration is making these overtures on this issue is, this last election, you know, if you lived in, in some, of those area, some of these areas that people feel kind of disenfranchised by the, the economy, they, they perhaps feel like um, their, the economic opportunity isn't what it was maybe 30 or 40 years ago um, as, you know, our major infrastructure like roads and bridges were being built. Um, 
the economic opportunity isn't quite there, perhaps. And, and there, people are concerned about that. And I think I'd ask um, Shirley and Doug to kind of just quickly say, well, why, why would Congress and the administration want to do something in this area? Um, and what would be the return on investment? So if I could just ask Shirley um, and maybe Doug to kind of pile on after that. Perfect. Thank you very much, Tim. So I look out at this audience, and I think most of you don't even know what it's like to live without the internet or have gone to school without the internet or have looked for a summer job or internship or even the job you're holding today without the internet. So it is, I think, as we go through that prism of time, um, the reality today is that the internet is obviously an integral part of our lives and, and touches everything. Reason I think um, it's so important, is, as um, Tim, you very aptly hit on, is there are parts of this country that it is really tough to serve. I mean, a lot of us have flown over you know, rural America and you see all those great grids of agriculture land. Knowing that we've got you know, a big portion of our population that lives out in those areas and certainly a big portion that uh, contributes greatly to the economy. Um, you know, when you think about natural resources, you think about um, agriculture and, and food supply. And yet you've got people who really, that handicap of distance means even more when you live in some of those remote areas because they don't have the luxury that we do to walk across the street to a library, a medical center, um, you know, have public safety access at your, at your fingertips. So when I think about um, the internet and access to broadband, at this point it really is an essential service. It's not even a luxury anymore like people used to think about it maybe after the passage of the 96 Telecommunications Act. The other thing that I think is really important is that um, recognizing aside from the social goods, you know, what, what can tell, you know, what can you do with telemedicine? What can you do using broadband um, for um, education and all kinds of other initiatives? It's the economic approach. And I think that's one of the things we heard really loud and clear after this last election, that the economy is really important and people are very concerned and people in rural America are very concerned. The Hudson Institute had done a study last year that showed that in 2000 and 15, the economic impact to the economy, the national economy, of rural broadband alone was $24.1 billion. And that and the most interesting thing about their study was that 66% of that positive impact actually benefited urban America. So when we think about like, well, let's do this, and, and you know, broadband's really important for rural America, it just shows you further how tied we are together as a country between our economy, the infrastructure, the networks. And those of us who have folks who actually build networks know that you, you, know, you don't just build a network and stop at the edge and hope somebody picks up the traffic. Because um, then you've got a big problem. So, you know, just kind of a brief snapshot. It, it is uh, beyond social goods, which I think are huge and frankly limitless. Um, I do think, you know, we need to take a look at the numbers and there is a big economic impact. And I do think, um, again, there's something to be said for finding something that folks across all aisles um, can agree upon. And I think infrastructure investment is one of those issues that if we could kind of turn to and get some energy behind, um, I think it's good for the entire country. Uh, Doug, can I ask you to like kind of amplify that and talk more broadly about internet infrastructure and why people should care? Sure, happy to. Um... Yeah, uh, as Tim mentioned, I'm Doug Brake with the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Uh, thanks for having me, and thanks to the caucus. Uh, yeah, happy to pull back, take a little bit uh, broader perspective. Uh, I am in strong agreement. We have a real opportunity here with a potential infrastructure package. Uh, and uh, broadband, tremendously important, but also a, a, a unique opportunity to look at what we at ITF call hybrid infrastructure. This infrastructure sort of moving beyond the classic concrete and rebar and trying to incorporate digital components within traditional infrastructure uh, projects. Uh, we don't, you don't really have to be that imaginative to see you know, how this can be a real boon to the economy, real uh, gains to productivity. Uh, good example is uh, sort of like a smart water network where you can use digital components to detect leaks or theft or something like that, monitor water quality, pollution, things like that, uh, better respond to flooding or droughts, uh, or even automatically optimize very sophisticated sort of uh, tr water treatment processing plants and things like that. Uh, there's also widely recognized benefits uh, for the electrical grid, you know, the smart grid, right? Uh, and this is beyond just sort of smart uh, pricing, more efficient pricing mechanisms. You can also implement real-time forensic analysis if there are disruptions, cyber attacks to the, uh, to the electrical grid. Uh, you can pull real-time information, reroute electrical uh, resources, uh, and also make the grid more resilient and, and uh, uh, 
better responding to, uh, to potential uh, problems. Uh, similar examples are abundant, uh, whether oil or gas pipelines, waste management, uh, roads, uh, more efficient tolling for, uh, for uh, highway infrastructure, bridges, bikeways, uh, the list goes on and on. So there's really a tremendous opportunity and real gains to be had by uh, introducing information technology into sort of classic infrastructure projects. So a lot of that is what sometimes you talk about is Internet of Things and having smart sensors. And I guess the, the, meta, the corollary with healthcare is like, you know, if you can get somebody from making that trip to the emergency room, which costs a fortune, um, that's really kind of a cost savings, right? And you're saying if, like, let's say we have a really smart uh, network and, and infrastructure, whether it be like a water main, and you had, if you built that water main with internet-enabled um, sensors, um, now we really don't know if the water main breaks until there's a huge hole in the ground and water is fountaining up from, from but you're saying perhaps we could see it starting to leak and maybe we could have more tailored re resources that would cost less and things like that. So that's, that's the kind of the two parts of why we might want to do this. Um, on the panel, these are all fantastically qualified panelists up here. However, because this issue is so massive, I and mean, we're talking about infrastructure, we're talking about uh, tax breaks, we're talking about uh, capital investment and in, in, in infrastructure, there are so many different perspectives that could be on that pa this panel. Um, I think you know the schools and libraries that could be on this panel are a really important part of this entire equation. Um, there's communities of color that could be on this. <laughs> this that could be people representing like more urban poor and. There are so many different perspectives that aren't here. This is kind of just the start of the conversation. So I for, forgive me for like not including uh, having a 20-person panel, which would be kind of unyieldy, uh, uh, unwieldy. So uh, or, and unyieldy, uh, as the case may be. So um, That's a great word, unyieldy. Yeah, we're going to have. <laughs> This panel, this panel is not going to be unyieldy. I think everybody here is in favor of like robust internet infrastructure, however, what, however we get there. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I think the premise is we're all for robust internet infrastructure. Um, I guess the question is how do we get there? And, and again, there are three baskets. Let's take the first one, like you know, appropriations and, and providing kind of a stimulus for that. And, and Blair, you wrote the with about a cast of about 50 other people, the National Broadband Plan from 2010 at the FCC. Can you kind of talk about what, you know, your, your main thrust, and I know that's, it was a huge report, but, you know, the main thrust of the National Broadband Plan and how, what have you learned since then on, if, if you had the opportunity now again, you know, what, what should Congress and the administration do with investing in internet infrastructure? Well, the, the, the first thing is that uh, the United States National Broadband Plan, which was about the 38th of about 155 countries that have done them, addresses three questions, and all 158 plans have addressed the same question, three questions. How do you get affordable uh, fund and bandwidth everywhere? How do you get everybody on? How do you use it better to deliver public goods and services? Um, that's what we truly try to do with the plan. The, the better analogy to the infrastructure funding is actually work we did, and I was on the Obama transition team, where we actually, about a third of the um, Recovery Act was dedicated to infrastructure. Um, there were a lot of things there. Uh, I won't go into the TikTok of history, but I'm not sure we got the broadband piece uh, correct. Uh, and some of the lessons I learned from that uh, were part of an op-ed thing that I just did with my friend downs eight lessons if there is an infrastructure plan and if it includes broadband here are like eight things including kind of dig one's requirements including where to focus including uh, how you how you do that so I think you know there's there's an awful lot of lessons um, that one can look at I will mention one lesson that goes to something Doug just said that I didn't we did not include in the that Larry and I wrote, which he also testified about last week, uh, um, which is not just on telecom stuff, but all the other stuff, roads and bridges and airports, ought to incorporate certain kinds of what you might think of as Lego functionalities. In other words, how do you plug in the sensors, the small cell radios, and all of that thing? I think that's actually a really important point and may drive much greater economics than 20 billion or whatever. Uh, we spend on infrastructure, which I'm pretty sure, if it happens, will be focused entirely on rural, as opposed to driving it across the board. But let me just say, because I think it's actually it's the big elephant in the room that everybody is missing, which is often the case in this town. Um, 
and I, and I, I uh, part of my resume that never gets mentioned here uh, for good reasons because it's so incredibly boring um, is that I spent 10 years being a municipal bond lawyer. Um, Reed and I made up the fact that I was that I did some communication stuff. I, I was, but that's not really important. Uh, what is important is I have a sensitivity to that. And by the way, much better education to work at the FCC than most people's education. And I say this for, because you have to know where the money comes from and where it's going, which is like a really important thing that until you do due diligence on a bond project, you may not know. But here's the thing. Most of the, Trump is talking about a trillion dollar tax infrastructure plan over 10 years. That pales in comparison to the amount that state and local governments spend on infrastructure almost every year. And uh, there are two provisions in the so-called tax plan that would have a very devastating effect on infrastructure generally. Um, I, I, I think they would get rid of the local and state um, tax deduction for bonds, and as well as they very consciously will get rid of the local and state tax deduction uh, when people pay their tax, state and local taxes. So you have both raised the cost of financing and you've lowered the amount of money available financing for schools, for libraries, for state and local roads. It's all great to talk about broadband. I think broadband's really important. I could, I could entirely agree with everything that Doug and Shirley said. I would only add that there's a really important economic point, which is the cost the way we do it in this country, inures to the private sector carrier. The benefits are largely to the public. The carrier is only looking at the benefits of the subscription rates. But when you talk about savings of smart grids and water, and that's not really going to the communications network. That's really going to. Um, but my point is, if we, if we have an infrastructure bill, but at the same time kill off the ability of state and local governments to do infrastructure, we're really doing a huge so Lisa, um, if you, you know, Blair kind of got into the, the weeds on you know tax incentives and, and the tax the tax issues. Let, let's let's go let's go back to the, the first basket. Let's say there was and again we don't have a plan, but if, if we're playing with the house's money, you know we're going to have you know taxpayer money spent on you know perhaps broadband infrastructure. How 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 would you see that being spent? Um, what, what's the best way to use that? Um, and you know, perhaps you can also talk about like how we've done that. Blair mentioned we've done this in the past with um, uh, the stimulus back in 2010, um, and you know, maybe maybe kind of build on you know what what's been done in the past and how you feel about some of that stuff. Thank Again, you. we're playing with the house's money. Right. We just play we're money because we don't know. People gambling a lot more than they should. Well, <laughs> regardless of uh, whose money it is, the money is scarce, and we know that. There's not much to go around. We went through this, as you said, in 2009 with the stimulus and the BTOP program administered by NTIA and the BIP program administered by RUS. And I think what we learned is that we have to be extremely careful with taxpayer resources and how they're spent. Um, at the end of the day, at least RUS indicated that it was intending to get to 7 million homes, new homes, and they only got to 300,000 with billions of dollars. And so if we're going to do this again, one of the things we have to do is think about the process for how it happens. Um, in the stimulus, uh, they did do a 350 million, I believe it was, mapping project, but the map came after the money was distributed. This time, our view is, if you're going to do this, let's focus and identify the problem areas before you start. Let's do the mapping beforehand. The FCC has data through its 477 collection of information that they can use to update the map. There's currently no funding for that. So our view is you have to identify the problem areas before spending money there so that you avoid using scarce taxpayer dollars, however, whatever mechanism you end up using. Um, for areas that already are served by broadband providers. Our industry alone has invested $250 billion in network infrastructure. I believe the number writ large for the industry is $1.5 trillion. You don't want to spend money to overbuild private risk capital that's already been invested. There are 5 to 7 percent of Americans today that have nothing. Let's identify the areas where there's zero, zero, target the money there, and deliver the broadband to those who don't have it. 
Uh, in addition, you can have mechanisms that work better, have competitive bidding when, um, for areas where there are multiple providers that may want to provide that service. Be willing to acknowledge that in those areas where there is no broadband service today, that maybe wireline is not the answer, that there are alternative technologies that can be used. And we have to be willing to look at creative solutions to get to the last part of America. And finally, to make sure that taxpayer resources are not wasted, we have to ensure transparency and accountability in the way money is spent. I don't think we have a very good track record of that. And I think whether it's through tax credits, whether it's through grants, whether it's through loans, and our experience with loans is that you end up overbuilding because the only way to get loan money paid back is by going to dense areas, <laughs> that, you, that you are accountable for that and you acknowledge that. Surely, um, and, and let me also say that um, uh, we can get back, I think later we can get back to if, if there were the House's money and appropriations for broadband, uh, what it, what's the appropriate agency to do that, and how how should that be done? And we can we can have a, a deeper discussion on that. Um, Blair mentioned that maybe uh, in 2010 the stimulus money wasn't done as effectively. Lisa has kind of said that as well, as far as that goes. And, and we didn't uh, the other people we didn't have on this panel are like folks from the NTIA and from from the RUS funds that administered that. In, in, in their defense, if I, if I can represent them for a second, um, we also have to realize what it was like in 2009. Um, we're, you know, they were it, was, it was kind of an economic calamity. And I think there was like some concerns about getting those monies out really quickly. So um, just to be devil's, devil's advocate or uh, the NTIA's advocate. Um, but surely, if you could build on kind of this first set of like, who, who's in need? How, how is that money best spent? Sure. So um, this is where Lisa and I actually don't disagree all that much um, as folks who actually represent infrastructure providers. So I think there's a few things. I think if we look at the stimulus, shame on us if we didn't learn something about what happened. Um, there were some good things that actually did come from that program. There are a lot of people who got service today who wouldn't have had service. There was actually also some really interesting programs that helped promote to people why, um, why the internet was useful for things more than just fast email and, and getting that adoption rate going up because, you know, it, uh, it's hard to believe, but 10 years ago, the adoption rate on broadband was ridiculously low. Um, in rural areas, it was about 25, 30%. So, you know, now we're at 73%, and that's a huge jump when you start showing people the applicability of it. But there's a few things. So I think we can learn some lessons, but I do think, you know, you've got, um, I think you look at things, and Tim, you referenced, you know, who should handle it. I look at the FCC and I say, you know what, the FCC is an expert agency. They know more about this industry and the infrastructure than anybody else. Now, should they be controlling necessarily all of the funding? I'm not sure, but they need to have a role to be coordinated. We tend to, you know, my, my companies, I represent about 850 rural companies that cover about 40% of the land mass, about 6% of the population base, but they're the folks who live out in these rural areas, and, you know, we need things like high-cost universal service um, to make sure that it is affordable for customers to get access to phone service, and now thanks to reforms that the FCC has just taken to broadband. So that has been extended to broadband, and that's really important, and that's really key. The other thing is, Lisa referenced the data, the 477 data. We finally have a sense of where, you know, where's infrastructure, where is it lacking. We have more of that transparency. We have provisions that require accountability. Um, if you are getting universal service support now to build a, a broadband network, you have to actually build it and show you're going to build it. And and as the FCC is working through their Connect America Fund 2 process, we're going to have even more accountability. Those carriers who chose to take that money are going to have to show that they're going to build in those markets. And if they can't, that money goes back into a pot to, to an auction process. Um, and let the carriers that are going to choose to go in there, go in and build, um, take that resource and actually do it. So I think it's a better use of some of the resources than we've seen in the past. I also think, um, you know, one area I probably might disagree with, I, I do think we have to be creative and a little bit technology agnostic, but I think we also have to be smart that when we're using um, resources that are coming from whether it's a government appropriation, whether it's a universal service fund, that you're future-proofing that network, that you're not doing something as a Band-Aid and coming in two years later and you're, and you're building something else. I, one of the misconceptions that drives me crazy, you know, we get this all the time, is, well, just, you know, wireless, it's so great, it's everywhere you know, 5G's coming, you know, um, wireless networks need a wired infrastructure. And the more robust broadband access you need, the more you need fiber connecting those towers. 
And, you know, so the idea that particularly if you talk 5G, you know, which everybody's all excited about, and I'm not sure we've seen, you know, even the standards yet, you know, that might need a tower every 300 feet. I look at that and think there are rural Americans who have driveways that it's going to take three towers to get down. At some point, you're better off just putting the fiber into the ground. So again, as we make these investments, let's be smart, let's be future-proofing them, and, and, and let's coordinate. I think the coordination is the key, but I think there's some real potential. Okay, let's get back to the agency question about administration and things like that, because we I think people have different grievances. If I could just ask, you know, Blair and Doug and, and anybody to jump in, um, uh, Shirley mentioned uh, having the standard be future-proofing networks. Um, other times, other administrations have kind of laid out, well, we need five megabytes by 2005 or 100 megabytes by 2010, and, and I've gone through the history of all the different, you know, benchmarking on where we would like to be uh, for different communities as far as high-speed internet goes. What, what's enough uh, for people? And what, what should we be looking for f to, to do the, as Doug and Shirley laid out in the, at the beginning, there's incredible economic opportunity, participation in democracy, participation in de uh, government services to be had by a good, sound internet infrastructure. What is good enough? Um, I think if we had folks from, like Jeff Eisenhower from the American Emirates Institute, and then right now 100% of um, continental United States is covered by you know, satellite access, and you have enough with that. So let's, let's kind of get into that discussion just really quickly, and I want to hear from you know, Doug and, and Blair and Lisa about what is enough, and what is good enough, and what is future-proof, or is it we just need abundance? I'm happy to jump in. So if, if I can, I, I promise I'll get to your question, but I want to rewind just uh, a little bit and go yeah. back to uh, some of the Fair points enough. that Blair made. Um, I worry that sometimes when you look at an infrastructure package and you're looking at the different sort of tools in the toolkit of what could be applied to, to expand infrastructure, broadband infrastructure, and sort of classical infrastructure uh, in, in terms of a, a, a bill, uh, I worry that sometimes that discussion can, be, can become too ideological. Uh, I'm a pragmatist. I say, you know, that we should be pouring money in wherever the benefits exceed the costs. And there, you have to recognize that one of the benefits of the private sector providing these sorts of infrastructure services are added efficiencies, uh, uh, added focus on efficiency, uh, both in the business model itself, but also in generating additional innovation down the, down the road. And so there's a bit of a trade-off, but then government can provide infrastructure most effectively when it comes to public goods, right? These are sort of the classic where it's very difficult to, to price uh, access to the infrastructure based on use. But there are other areas where the benefits exceed the costs, right? And this is where we start talking about rural areas. And it's so clear, I think, I don't know, what makes it very clear to me is where a traditional measure of the profitability of a potential broadband project uh, is, is often homes pass per mile of fiber. And once you get out into rural areas, you start talking about miles of fiber per home. And so once you hit that, that inversion period, you know that the, it's just not, the economics do not work. And so this is an area where you need actual money pouring into these if we're going to see if you're going to see a real uh, expansion of broadband. And so to, I think Blair is right that to be able to think that you can do this just through tax incentives alone going to get to the real problem, especially in rural areas. So that said, getting to, you, to the actual crux of your, of your actual question, uh, I think you have to focus on what's cost effective, right? Uh, I'm skeptical that the real economic benefits come from these extraordinarily high speed networks, right? You have to focus first on getting as many people connected at a reasonable speed. Uh, a lot of these infrastructure projects are just about conveying small amounts of information over a long period of time. You do not need multi-gigabit networks to be able to do that. And so I say, especially when you're looking at rural areas, look at what is most cost effective to provide. If that's an incremental increase in speed, you know, from if we, if you're, especially when you're looking down like really slow uh, old copper DSL networks, upgrading those to sort of 10 megabits, 25 megabits, uh, and then you know, where the economics make more sense, maybe looking up down the road at 100 megabits, something like that, uh, is very reasonable. But uh, but focus on where it's where it's most cost effective. Yeah, I I agree with Doug on that. I think one of the issues we've had is that we whether we're talking about 4, 1, 10, 125 or a gig. If you keep moving the performance thresholds up, you end up with unserved America everywhere. But when we're looking at the last 5% who have zero, zero, we have to focus on realistic solutions first and use the money wisely to get to them without moving the goalposts that beyond the 10-1 that you have right now for USF. 
And, you know, I agree with Shirley that it's good to, if people want to build a future-proof network, but that's different than the threshold for how you deliver the money to them to build it, to get to people who have nothing. So, so I'll make three observations. Uh, first, what we're talking about doing is what the FCC is doing and supposed to be doing with the Connect America Fund. So I think it should be done by the FCC um, kind of in coordination with the fund, but not to essentially duplicate the fund, but to essentially be a, a force multiplier to that fund. Um, and if you could explain you what the, about, just, yeah. just a quick on what the Connect America Fund is and how it's funded and how it's uh, The Connect America Fund is the successor to what was called the High Cost Fund, but when we were doing the broadband plan, we thought nobody wants to support a high cost fund. That sounds horrible. <laughs> So one of the people working on it said, let's, let's call it the Connect America Fund because everybody likes calves. Calves are very popular, and, and it's worked out that way. No, it's just a fund. They're, they're high-cost areas. Shirley's already talked about it. The economics go down, and we as a country have poured, depending on how you think of it, somewhere between 4 and $7 billion a year, I think pretty much since the 96 Act, into funding both the CapEx and OpEx, the capital expenditures and the operating expenditures. Where, where people need that in order to be able to provide um, the necessary service, as mandated by Congress. So my second point would be, we are currently funding both. I think that's actually a problem because it creates, it distorts incentives. So I would take the money and just fund CapEx now and, and, and spend it through a reverse auction with the FCC. They're very good at auctions. Um, uh, how you define it, and by the way, one of the problems I think you have is what you need for um, homes is very different than what you need for schools, libraries, healthcare facilities. So you have to design the auction uh, in a smart way. But I would essentially have a path A and a path B, so the Shirley's companies and others could either take a um, an approach which says we need annual funding because we're going to have both a capex and opex problem forever. Or if you just give us enough money now, we won't come back and put pressure on the, on the Connect America Fund. So that, my second point is do something a little bit different that is, I think, economically viable. Carol Maddy, who used to be at the FCC and basically wrote the Universal Service, part of the National Broadband Plan, she and I recently wrote about this as well. Um, uh, and there was a third point, which I've, oh, here's the third point. Remember the numbers. Um, by which I mean we're actually never going to get everybody. It doesn't make economic sense. Very quickly, when we did the National Broadband Plan, we're using a 4-1 rule. At, so this is 2010. Seven million homes not connected. There was a gap of about $13 billion. Um, more than 50% of that gap was the last 250,000 homes. Okay. So my point is, point, you know, less than a percent or less than, no, it's three percent of the unserved homes are more than 50 percent of the final cost. I disagree with a lot of what Jeff says, Jeff Eisenach, and I disagree that Satellite Now does enough for everybody, but there is some number where I think we just say, if you want to live that far away, you're not, you're, you're, you're on Satellite. That's, that's fine, because it's just, that part is unfair. But that's a, I think that's a reasonable argument, and I had a wonderful some of Shirley's members as to whether where they thought in order to comply with the law we should be willing to spend fifty thousand dollars per home per year because that's what the law required and I disagreed but uh, I don't hold Shirley to that by the way but that some of her members thought well let me that. let me give um, let me give Lisa and Shirley a chance to respond to you know some of the, some of those points. So um, one of the things that I actually, and, and Blair knows I disagree with him on, um, I think it is important to both build the network and sustain the network. I think, um, again, as network um, infrastructure providers, the cost of actually maintaining these networks is pretty significant. You don't just plop something in the ground and walk away and hope that you've actually done your job. And um, you know, one of the things that my folks see, and I'm sure Lisa's folks see the same, is the amount of pressure on these networks is growing literally by month. Um, when you start thinking about the edge provider and the amount of content that is being pushed out onto these networks, the, the need to have these networks be able to grow and expand. 
and, and control that. I don't know how many people, you know, sometimes go visit your parents and you're like, wow, your Wi-Fi really stinks. Well, it's really the amount of network devices that are now connected um, that we're not even thinking about anymore. And, you know, my guys actually have the ability because they manage the network to see that, well, you used to have eight devices. Now you have 15 because, you know, you've got your Hue lights and you've got, you know, your Internet of Things and all of that. Um, so I, I do think that um, maintaining that is really important. And whether you look at universal service doing both, whether you look at um, RUS and some of those other traditional programs as a capitalization um, support mechanism as well, I, I think is really important. But um, I do think it's hard, you know, when you start talking about, you know, where people choose to live and how discretionary that is. Um, people live where they are. And, you know, we get resources from, you know, those people who live in those villages in Alaska, um, that, that's where they're born to. So I, I worry when we start creating policies that basically say, um, you know, you've relegated it to yourself. But, but to, can, to, can, I, can I respond very quickly to that? Yeah, because you okay. and I actually don't disagree on the point that a lot of your companies need both CapEx and OpEx. What I'm saying is, if you have a pool of money, don't just duplicate the current fund. I, there are a number of companies, and I could be wrong about this, but this is what an auction would prove that if you gave them a big enough check for CapEx, which always would include working capital or whatever, they could get off of the universal service um, system, have the network, and in those communities, if, if you're not paying any debt service for a network, an advanced network, you'll be okay. That's what an auction tells us, right? Because if they're not willing to take the check, then the auction fails. And I would just note, I was earlier today, I had something on the recent incentive auction. When we pr proposed that in the plan, the broadcasters told me, no broadcaster will participate. And I said, really? You, you know, like, you don't want to take the billions of dollars? And they said, absolutely not. I, I think the only way to find out is by actually doing an auction. And I suspect if you had $20 billion, there'd be a number of rural companies that said, I could build an, I could build a all fiber network and still make money if I don't have any debt service. And we're looking forward to seeing how that goes. And I will, I will then turn it to Lisa. But I, the other point I'd love to tee up as we talk about some of the stuff that I think is important, and it kind of goes to the unserved, is, is how do we think, which is hard in Washington, but think out of the box about how you do some of that. So, you know, we'll wait to see what happens with the Connect America Fund. We're actually working with some folks in the um, rural utility industry on the electric side of the house to roll out um, what we kind of call our broadbandmatch.com. Um, and it is a web portal that literally says, is it your community? You know, are you unserved? Are you looking for somebody to come in? How do we literally connect um, providers who might be willing to go into those communities because, you know, they may be contiguous. They may be neighboring communities. It might make sense. Um, <laughs> Um, or there may be some good economic initiative for the state to do it. But how do you start connecting those who can build networks with those who are looking for that service? You know, how do we start some of these dialogues that just frankly don't seem to take place the way you think that they would um, on a local community level? And before Lisa responds, um, after Lisa, I'm just going to go to the audience for some questions. So please welcome your questions, not long statements in lieu of a question, but just uh, questions. So, Lisa. Um, I guess I, uh, on this count, I totally agree with you, Shirley. Um, we just published a blog post about one of our companies, uh, Eagle Communications in St. Francis, Kansas, and what they did was they worked with their local community who desperately wanted uh, gig and higher speed services in their town. They made an agreement that if uh, they could come up with enough customers and did some demand aggregation, that they could come up with a way to deploy it, and they're going to do it now. And I think a lot of that is going to happen at the local level and between partnerships between private enterprise and the communities themselves. Um, I guess going back to the point that you were making about, I think to the extent, and I sound like a broken record here though, but you know, if we're going to use public dollars, it has to go to ways to build out to the unserved areas. And you mentioned Alaska. GCI is a perfect example of a company who used the RUS money to give the RUS a plug. Unserved communities, very low density, tough geography, and they took the federal dollars and they built out throughout areas of Alaska that would never have received service without a subsidy. So we just need to be smart about the way we do it and be creative about it and not get into overbuilding private enterprise who are willing to take the risk to build in those areas. 
need to keep encouraging private investment in the kind of partnerships that you're talking about, particularly in rural America? While I wait for people to build up the courage to ask a question, just raise your hand uh, and we can go there. I want to next ask a question. Um, everybody's building up the courage to ask a question. So just raise your hand. Uh, after that, let's kind of talk. We haven't really talked that much about the states and, and municipalities um, and the roles that they play, particularly given um, you know, a lot of conservative folks would rather say you know, the states and local communities and governments know how to do this stuff best and how do we, how do we empower them um, in this equation. So we haven't talked about that. So let's talk about that a little bit. But I'm looking for the person who has the courage to ask a question right there. It just identify who you are. Okay. Yeah, and, and for the folks on, on the live stream, let me just repeat it really quickly. Uh, the question was about uh, new kind of like satellite technologies, whether it be by balloon, by drone, um, or by satellite. I think SpaceX is talking about launching a necklace of satellites. Uh, some of you might remember uh, a, a Macaw Initiative back in Teledesic. Um, but um, yeah, so if we could talk about bringing that, that, that solution, hope for the future. Well, I, I ha happened to look this up right before I came here, that in March 2017, and I am not the spokesman for the satellite industry, to be <laughs> clear, Hughes did announce that they were going to have, uh, you know, the first and only U.S. satellite service to offer FCC-defined broadband speeds. Another company named Viasat is doing the same. I mean, I do, I do think there's going to be change and developments in the satellite industry that will allow them to compete in the areas. I don't think they're a static industry. So for those remote areas where the topography and geography simply make it cost prohibitive to deploy, satellite may ultimately, you know, as it evolves, become a solution. And what you're talking about, let me also, let's also make sure we uh, compare like three different things here. Uh, you're talking about some of the things that are in the news. Um, I mentioned like two different types. We're talking about drones and balloons that can kind of stay stationary over a given landmass. Uh, we're also talking about, um, I, I mentioned, uh, geostationary satellites that are way up there, at, I mean, how many, how, how many miles, that have really far, vast distances for signals go up and down. And then um, we also have something that SpaceX is talking about as low Earth orbiting satellites that move so fast, uh, you have to have a bunch of them, but they move over different land masses and countries. So those are three different types of things we're talking about. Blair, is this all real or? Yeah, well, so here's, your, here's the fundamental problem. It's the same problem, do you get the iPhone 7 or wait for the 8? Right? I mean, it's, and, and by the way, this was a problem back in the days of IBM, and it was, it's, it's always a problem of do you wait for the next generation. This problem was supposed to be solved by a company called Teledesic back in the late 90s, funded by Craig McCaw and Bill Gates, two very, very smart guys, and it, I, I remember the first meetings on it, and it collapsed. So you don't really know. I would just note that when we looked at it, and, and my, so my knowledge is a little out of date, but... Uh, there are two big problems that people tend to. One is there is a latency problem, that if you're really doing things that need to be quick, particularly telemedicine, voice, things that can't download and you, mean, you want people to be able to respond right away, there's, there's a time lag, just laws of physics. And the second thing is they say they can offer these speeds, but that's with a limited number of customers. So that when we were doing the plan, satellite guys could do something, but it would only be about 200,000 people could be on it. So will this, you know, eventually, as John Maynard said, you know, this problem will be solved and we'll all be dead. But, but I can't, but you can't, the, the question is, do you wait? Because if you wait, sure, you'll solve the problem and then surely people will be out of luck for another five years. But it's a hard, it's a hard question. It's not a simple one. I, and I also think, you know, you talk to people who have satellite and, and um, and you had mentioned that, you know, someday, and that, and, you know, that is the question, you know, when, when does that technology actually become prime time? The other thing you throw in is, you know, heaven forbid, it's like raining. Um, the interference factors, you've got to have a clean line of sight. There's all kinds of things that wind up becoming, um, making it an imperfect technology at this point in time. Is it, is it a decent backup? Um, you know, but do you want it to be your primary um, source? I, I think it's just not there yet. But I guess my question is, 
2009 when they did the stimulus, the number was X for unserved areas, and today the number is X. So what do you do to move the needle? You've got to be able to move the needle. We're talking about, and I'm not talking about satellite being the answer here. I'm just saying if we're going to now infuse money into getting to these last 5%, and I couldn't agree more that it's absolutely urgent that the entire country be connected, we have to come up with solutions that work because that didn't happen over the last seven years. Are we further along than we were then? Oh, yeah, we are. How much more, though? I, I would say actually order of magnitude. You were unserved yes. since 2009. Was that a good response? Yes, thank you very much. Sir? Um, if you could identify yourself and, and ask a question. through the great capital infusion into the community in the late 90s, and also as one who makes my money working for Wall Street, don't assume that because there's a big capital flow to a sector that it's actually, uh, that it, having said that, yeah, but, I, but don't, don't confuse those two. Yeah, I, th I think the folks up here have lived, <laughs> I mean, lived through these discussions for a long time, and we might be a little jaded. Mm -hmm. I think, I think, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm like Anderson Cooper, I have eye rolls all the time. Uh, that said, um, I think there's a tremendous amount of excitement that's kind of new when it comes to uh, launching of satellites and, and space technology, where we are today, um, and some of the, the imagination that's going into things like drone broadband and balloon dirigible broadband. So I leave you with like, just it's exciting, um, and we might be a little jaded. If I can, just, just one small point. I, I, I do think it is an important point that uh, a lot of these companies and some of the large web scale companies are looking at these as solutions for the sort of like next billion to join the internet, right? They're looking at rural India, rural China, where, you know, the cost structure is even uh, more difficult just because there's not an ability to pay nearly the same as, as in the United States. And so I, I do think that the, there's a real opportunity, but I agree with Blair that it's, it's not there yet. There's a reason that Google put this in its moonshot category, right? But at the at the same time, I think the, the, it uncovers an important point that we want any of these potential government programs to be technology neutral and not try to choose what sort of technology is uh, to promote, right, and, and leave it open to, you know, an, an open field for innovation to potentially solve these problems. So uh, any other questions? Um, we have about seven minutes left. policy side, I try to do a lot of things to make it a more favorable environment. On the Wall Street side, I would say we're excited. I'm kind of bearish on it because I don't see where the revenue comes from to repay for it. I don't, I don't see the new markets and stuff like that. So I think that's the fundamental thing. Number two, the question of how do you get local governments to be cooperative, Google's already answered that. Google said back in 2010, we got something that's really fantastic. Anybody want to help us? 1,100 communities applied. They got everything they wanted out of every community they agreed to reach. Now, it may let go to. Now, the, the problem is, like 5G, the, the market for a third provider of wireline, it's tough. 
but it was not cities that were blocking it. So my, my view, and there's been 22 states that have legislation and all this kind of stuff, I actually, with, with respect to the carriers, I think they're making a mistake by trying to, from the point of view of the cities, shove things down their throats, as opposed to saying, we got something really great, you created artificial scarcity as Google did, uh, actually it's not artificial, um, people respond and then you go to those places. There's actually a market, and again, I, I don't know any city, I don't know any mayor, and I've talked to a lot of them, who doesn't want that 5G and wouldn't be willing to cooperate if they felt they had a cooperative partner on the other side. So I think I look at it a little bit differently than you guys look at it, but that's not really gonna be the problem. The real problem is gonna be, we all know how, we, there's a bridge to basically financing a huge amount of infrastructure, but if you don't have a clear revenue stream, it's very hard to get the financing for it, and that's what we don't have. And can I just quickly jump in? I think it is one thing we haven't talked about today. Those, those barriers are huge. You know, whether you're crossing federal lands, BLM, railroad rights away, um, all of those things are huge obstacles. They hold up multi-million dollar projects, so it's an excellent point to make sure we throw in. That may be true of the federal government, but, but I, I disagree with the notion that it's the cities. But, I, you know, reasonable minds can differ, and there's a lot of data going both ways. I'd say there's, I mean, opportunity uh, uh, abounds, right? There, there are barriers to some extent, whether it's a federal city, uh, and attacking those uh, at least helps on the margin if you're trying to weigh the opportunity for revenue versus the extremely high cost of deploying 5G to the extent that you can move the ball incrementally. Uh, I, I say why not? You know, I do, I do agree that the, the best ideal solution is real cooperation between the municipality and, the, and an operator. Uh, but if there are other opportunities that, that would really make a, a difference, uh, difference in that, that balance of, of the capex to deploy and the revenue that, that um, I agree is a challenging equation, uh, I say, you know, why not go after it? Yeah. So with the 30 seconds we have left, in closing, uh, let's, say, let's say that uh, President Trump has a really pliant uh, House and Senate, uh, and whatever he asks for is going to get and you have, you have like 10 seconds with President Trump uh, in the Oval Office to say, he says, what, I'm writing it down right now, uh, what should we do? And you know, what's your, what's your 10 second pitch uh, to what to include with whatever you're gonna send up to the Hill? That would be that. I'd say fund broadband to uh, your voter base in those rural areas that supported you and don't have broadband so they can't read your multiple tweets. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take part of that. Um, I, I would just say, you know, broadband is critical to um, our economic growth, and it's a worthy investment and should be included in any package. The same. I mean, funding broadband, funding actual infrastructure projects, especially in rural areas, uh, is a tremendous opportunity, especially if we can focus on incorporating digital components and seeing a real economic multiplier come out of a, a, a true infrastructure. Well, if I had 30 seconds with Trump, I would not be talking about infrastructure. <laughs> <laughs> we were so close. Yeah, right. <laughs> Number two, I would say if we were talking about infrastructure, I'd talk about the incredibly negative implications of this tax plan. But number three, I, you know, basically, I, I, it's kind of what Carol and I said. Finish the job of connecting the last 5%. They're all your voters. Uh, you got 90% of those votes. Just finish the job. You can do this within two or three years. And order of magnitude, the cost is somewhere between 20 and 40 billion dollars, but it's not your money. So go ahead and do it. Thank you. Um, I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank the caucus co-chairs, and thank you for coming.